reign in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have instructed, this is God speaking to Elijah, I have instructed the ravens to supply you with food there. So Elijah did what the Lord told him to do. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Some time later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father God, we just think about this uh, passage of Scripture, a very simple seven verses, but it tells us so much about you, our Father in heaven, and about Elijah. And I just pray that we would learn from his life and apply the truths that we learn to our lives, that we might be transformed even to be more like Jesus every day. We just pray your blessing upon each one here. We pray this all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Now, uh, I, I mentioned this before, that I played organized football. Yes, I don't look like a football player. Actually, uh, Justin looks like a football player, and he played a lot of football. But I played from Pee Wee to Pop Warner to under-17 select football. I'm actually a 10-year veteran of the Gred Iron, and you, I don't look it, but I still love playing football. I always play football with my boys at Thanksgiving, and uh, we play rough touch, but, you know, not with pads and helmets and stuff, which maybe I should. And uh, when I was 12 years old, I had a coach. His name was Goes, G-O-E-S. That was his last name, Coach Goes. And he led the team, the Hawthorne Hawks. I was part of that team. Actually, the Hawthorne Hawks was in the newspaper, Burlington County Times, many times. It was great. Uh, Coach Goes was a funeral director. And we used to like to laugh about that, the fact that his last name was Goes. So we would say, when you're about to go, go with Goes. <laughs> I thought that would be great if he had that on his sign. He never put that on his sign for some reason. But he was tough. He was a tough coach. He was tough on us. And he taught as well. You said something out of place, and it cost you a run around the field. You had an attitude towards someone or to the coach, and it was 20 push-ups with full equipment on. You know, putting down a teammate, 25 jumping jacks right there. He wouldn't let things like that go. He was tough on us. We learned to respect coach goes. We re learned to respect one another, and we learned and respected the game for what it was. We learned discipline, teamwork, and plays that actually won games. And the three years that I was with him, we had winning seasons every single year. He's the only coach, by the way, I remember by name, and I had a lot of coaches. Why? Because I learned from him. In the pain, in the discipline, even sitting on the bench when I mouthed off to the ref, I learned from him. Was he tough? Yeah. Was he a great coach? You better believe it. You see, I believe that we learn best during difficult times, not when times are easy. We learn best when things are bad, not when things are good. It's not in the easy times. And I really believe that in order to get from the classroom to real life, there's got to be some pain in your life. And we don't like pain. Matter of fact, I'm <laughs> I pick on Americans, but I think most of the world does not like pain. We don't want to suffer. If it's more than 72 degrees in here, we're, we're out of here because we want the air conditioner on all the time. We don't like pain. We don't like discomfort. But hardship teaches us how to apply the truths of the classroom. You know, it's every one of God's major players in Scripture needed that kind of training that Elijah had. The Lord directed 
Elijah from the courts of the king to a ravine. Basically, he told him, go hide. Get out of here, get out of the court of the king and go to this ravine and hide for a while. I'm not sure I would have taken that direction pretty, that, that well. But in that ravine, God would mold Elijah there. If it was up to me, if I were God, I would have had Elijah stay and be in Ahab's face daily. And then I would have Elijah go out into the streets and tell the whole nation how bad Ahab is and how bad Jezebel is and, and start a revolt. That's what I would have told Elijah to do if I were God. God takes him out of the court and says, and do you see the direction? Go east, go across the Jordan, and go to this ravine and stay there. I, I'm, I, this is, I'm, I just faced Ahab the king. What, do you, what, are you, what are you doing with me? You know, I, God had a different plan than I'm sure Elijah was thinking about. God had Elijah's spiritual life in mind. You see, I believe God wants the heart of a person before he can use that person for his kingdom. Oh, you got talent, I got talent. Well, maybe I don't have that much talent anymore. But you know, I think I could do it. I don't need God to do it. I could just use my talent, right? No, God doesn't want you and your talent. He wants your heart. And then he can use you. And some of us are so proud of him. Some of us have a big head and, you know, all right, you know, what's it gonna, what's it gonna take? Well, there's A.W. A. Tozer, by the way, which is a Christian Missionary Alliance guy from the past. A. T T this quote is, too, I hear this too many times. I don't like the quote. But A.W. Tozer once said this, it is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. It is doubtful that God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Think about your best coach. Think about the sergeant that was over you when you were, you were in training and how he yelled at you, and how he hurt you, and how he made your muscles sore, and how he made you sometimes cry in pain. He wanted you to the best that you could be. And sometimes God allows hurt so deep. And I, I have seen that in my ministry. I have seen families go through such pain. I've seen a couple lose their four-year daughter four-year-old daughter in a car accident. I've seen a nine-year-old who died, who was killed. A 17-year-old who died in a car accident. People in my church who hurt so deeply. But you know, out of the pain and out of that loss, they started a new ministry. They started to do things for God's kingdom that they never did before. It happens. Sometimes God allows things to happen because he wants your heart. He wants you. And there in the, in the Kareth ravine, and by the way, the, the Kareth actually is derived from a verb that means to cut down or to cut off. I mean, Elijah in this ravine was cut off from society. Um, and again, the thing about it is, what are you doing to me, God? I'm thinking, if I were Elijah, I'd be saying, what are you doing to me, God? God was, was making him great. Elijah was being cut off from society. He was being taken out of the game. He was being sidelined by God, the coach. I want you to sit on the sideline. Well, but didn't I do a good job? I mean, I did exactly what you told me. And by the way, doesn't, it's very interesting the passage says that Elijah never even argued with God. God said, go, 
He went. That's what the Bible says. I don't know. I would have given God a lot of argument there, you know? But God wanted to change him. In Chuck Swindoll's book, uh, A Character Study on Elijah, of which I have gleaned much, he makes this note. Before being taken out, the writer of the, in Kings, the, the scribe who wrote the Kings, describes Elijah as just the Tishbite. You see that in the beginning, just the, Elijah the Tishbite. By the time we get to verse 24, which is next week, the widow recognizes Elijah as the man of God. He went from Elijah, this Tishbite who came from this part in Gilead, to Elijah, the man of God. What was in between? You know what was in between? The valley. The valley, the dark time. He went from Elijah the Tishbite to the man of God. Now, again, it, his pronouncement, it won't ring for the next few years until I say so. I don't know about you, but I, 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 what would it look like if it didn't rain? I mean, droughts for a week or two happen around here, right? And Janet was mentioning as we were driving in, look at all the lawns, they're brown, you know? Droughts happen. And they, we can recover from a drought. I mean, we can even recover from maybe a month without rain. But two or three years without rain? I had an opportunity to go to Burkina Faso. I mentioned this before, I, I believe. Burkina Faso is a little sub-Sahara African country. And it was during the dry season. And, uh, and I want to show you um, what the dry season looked like. Yes. That's the dry season. And uh, again, that's the pastor's house, by the way. And you're wondering where I'm taking all these pictures from? I'm up, actually up on top of the roof there. So that's me taking pictures. But look how dry. Do you see one blade of grass? Do you see anything green in that picture? For miles and miles and miles. And this was only five months without rain. By the way, can you imagine waking up to blue skies every day? That's exactly what they do for five months. No dew, no rain, just dry. As a matter of fact, we came upon um, a hand-dug um, well, and uh, they were, this is hand-dug. There's a tool that they use, and they just scrape around and scrape around and scrape around. And I, I said to the guy, I said, I want to go down inside. So I went down inside. That second picture is me taking a picture up at the... As I was going down, there was some movement in the bottom of the well. And, he go, and the, the translation was, watch out for the critters. And I said, what critters? Snakes and very large scorpions can't climb out. So, so when I got down there, I poised myself so I wouldn't step on the snakes. But anyway, that's dry. That is hard rock dry. And that's only five months. We have no idea what it would have been like for three years without rain. I think Ahab knew it, and I think Jezebel knew it. But let's talk about the Kareth Ravine, where a person is cut off from the rest of the world. Notice that he just stayed there. As a matter of fact, you know, it says he obeyed God without question, and, and, he, and he stayed there. The word, the Hebrew word for that he stayed there implies that he was was going to live there. He was going to live there until God told him to move again. He actually had probably bought his backpack with whatever supplies he had and was going to camp out and live there until God told him to move. It's a very interesting Hebrew word. He maybe thought it was going to be just a few days of R&R &R to live by the creek on bird food. Some scholars believed he was there for almost a year. Elijah had been sidelined. He was being fed by ravens. You know, it, it, by the way, it gives new meaning to being eating like a bird. You know, like we always say some girls eat like a bird. Well, Elijah ate like a bird. Bread and meat. I was watching some birds, you know, you know pick up the 
bread, sometimes we take too many bagels and we throw them out for the birds and they'll pick out the bird and the bird will fly away with a piece of bread that big. How many pieces of bread and how many little pieces of meat would it take to make a meal? He was the bird man. And how long was it? Some scholars believe that he was there for almost a year. Week after week, month after month, just waiting and waiting and waiting. How would you, how would you have to go camping and uh, not be told how long you're going to go camping for? And you go camping for a week or two and then it goes, turns into a month or three months. It turns into six months. And you kind of think, you know, um, how long is this camping going to go on? And there's no answer. There's no answer. He just waited and waited. And again, I, I'm amazed what the scripture says, verse 5. He said that Elijah did what the Lord told him to do. Just amazing. Elijah fully developed from being Elijah the Tishbite to being the Elijah the man of God, from God's mouthpiece to being God's person. See, God had to get him out of the public eye and get him to not look at what he was doing for God, but to look at his heart and why he was doing what he was doing for God. We don't ask that. You know, um, I, I love the fact that we have lots of volunteers for VBS, and there are a lot of people that volunteer for the cafe and stuff like that. You know, what, one of the things that we need to constantly remind ourselves is the why we do what we do. Is our heart really into it? Are we really thinking that we're a part of God's kingdom? Remember, we, we say to know the king and to serve his kingdom. Do we really believe that? We're straightening out the chairs or we're helping with VBS. Do we really believe that we're a part of his work in this world? And that's what, that's what God wanted for Elijah. He wanted him to know him first and have his heart first before he did anything else. He had to depend upon God, right? The birds were bringing him food. He had to develop a dependence on God, not on himself. He had to take direction well and exhibit first-time obedience. By the way, I always like to ask the question, you know, parents, young parents, do your children respond to first-time obedience? When you say no, do they stop? When you say stop, do they stop? Or do they argue with you? You have to develop first time. It may save their life when they are running into the street and the car is coming by and you say stop and they say, why should I stop? Elijah had first time obedience. God said it once and he did it. Man, we should have that, right? Of course, you may be thinking that, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to ask God, you know, all right, you want me to do this? What's in it for me? Maybe you think I'll obey, but it depends on whether I feel like it, whether I think it's best for me, whether it's convenient for me, whether I have the time to do it. We often give God attitude, don't we? We give God attitude. And sometimes we actually feel like, God is speaking to us, you know, go over and talk to that person. You haven't been over to your neighbor's house in a long time. Bake them a plate of cookies, you know. Start praying for them. Uh, why me? Why, why me, God? Can't you, uh, can't you send somebody else? Right? Is that, is, that, is that our attitude sometimes? Why me? Send someone else. Actually, Moses had that attitude too, by the way. You see, God wanted his heart, and God wants each of our hearts. He wants each of us to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ in all that we say and all that we do. 
He is constantly training me. He's constantly changing me. He's constantly expanding my horizons. I'm praying for someone I really don't want to pray for this week, by the way. I'm mad at them, but I know that I have to pray for them and I have to love them in Christ Jesus. And by the way, I have argued with God. He always wins, but I've argued with God. See, transformation takes time and hard work, and it is a constant battle because we are always in this world. We always have our sinful nature, and we are constantly in battle with what the world is doing and what we are called to do. Which, by the way, if you haven't noticed, is extremely different. Extremely different. What the world believes and what we believe from the scriptures is different. And people are not gonna like us when we tell them what God thinks, when we are spokesmen for God. So he went from a mountaintop experience in the court of the king to the valley. He went from palace to a brook. Do you, by the way, do you think he was confused? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm thinking, if I were Elijah, you told me to go to King Ahab, make this pronouncement like a prophet of God, and I did, and now you want me to sit by a creek? Do you think he was confused? Did he, you, here's one. Do you think Elijah was thinking, am I being punished, right? Am I, am I being punished? Did I, did I say it wrong? I did it. I said exactly what you told me to say. That, what, what, am I being punished, God? How about this one? He sits by the brook for almost a year, and then the brook dries up, and there is no direction given. You see that? The brook dried up. Now he doesn't have any water, and he's waiting on God, and God's not saying anything. I don't know about you. Would you be worried? You know, again, I, I, I find it just incredible. We go through this, too, from catching a touchdown pass to sitting on the bench. That happened to me, by the way. I did. I caught a touchdown pass, and then he, wanted, he benched me because I shouldn't have been where I was. But the quarterback threw it to me. I was supposed to be blocking, and he benched me. From graduating college with honors to being unemployed, from living a healthy life and eating the right things to being diagnosed with cancer. God, I'm doing all the, I'm doing all the right things. What's this about? What's happening? No explanations. God gives us no explanations. And by the way, God doesn't even give us reasons why it's happening. Oh, but we can sometimes figure out the reasons, especially if it's a result of sin. We can figure out those reasons. But when we are literally doing his will and doing what is right, and by the way, I have pastor friends who spent, I have pastor friend Kevin, who spent 14 days in the hospital and was gonna die of COVID, and he was doing everything right for the Lord. Why him? Maybe I can mention a couple of bad pastors that I'd love to get COVID and be in the hospital for 14 years, 14 years, 14 days, but I wouldn't wish that upon anybody right now. But if you're doing everything right, what happened? God gives no explanation, no reasons. And by the way, Elijah isn't the only one in Scripture that had, had this happen to him. I think Elijah's in good company. Do you remember Abraham who waited decades for the promised child, Isaac? Do you remember that? Do you remember Jacob who worked and waited 14 years so that he could marry his bride, Rachel? What was that about? Change the rules on him twice? Matter of fact, to change the rules on him about three times there. Or how about Moses, a leader who was sidelined in Midian for 40 years taking care of sheep when he was the prince of Egypt? What do, you think, what do you think Moses was thinking when he was out there 40 years watching sheep? 
when he came from the court of the king. See, God wanted to teach them something that they could not learn in public. These great men of God had to learn from their personal trainer, Jesus Christ, aspects of ministry that they could not learn in the public eye when everybody was around. And they had to learn it. Paul, the apostle, he had many events where he was sidelined. He was lowered in a basket after being an evangelist. He spent two years in the desert. Then he was forgotten 14 years while he, he fixed tents in Tarsus. Then there was the three years when he spent time in jail. The greatest evangelist on the planet, the greatest missionary on the planet at that time, and he spent three years in jail. What was that about? God, couldn't you get him out of jail? You got Peter out of jail? Why, why can't you get me out of jail? No reasons given, no explanation. Sometimes God is silent. I know he is. He's silent. And you're not going to understand this, that life is like that. Life is like that. This world is broken and imperfect, even brutal at times, yet God is still in control. Elijah obeyed without question, and he stayed without question because he knew his God was in control, and what God says goes. He stayed there. He lived there. By the way, the word it means actually he went and lived there. You know, I'm, I'm speaking to myself. The reasons for being sidelined are, are not shared. We cannot say that we're being punished for sin. I believe God wanted some personal time with each one of them. Elijah was still sitting by the creek and communing with the Spirit of God for that whole year. And even when it dried up, he stayed, not knowing what was going to happen. You know, you obey God and you move to another state or a new job and, and things are going well, then of no fault of your own, the brook dries up and you're, you're let go of your new job. Out of obedience of, of God, you get married, you, you, you get pregnant, the child is delivered, has birth defects. Did God stop all of a sudden caring for you? Life has its ups and its downs. You see, we need to change our plan and, and make sure that we're listening to God's plan. You see, the Bible says that God gives and God takes away. That's what the Bible says. You know, see, we have such an entitlement mentality in our nation that I'm entitled to certain things. Like when I turn on the water, it's got to be clean, perfect water, and it should never be taken away from me. I'm entitled to that. When God gives me a mate, they should never be taken away. I'm entitled to have that mate for all of my life. When God gives me a child, that child should never be taken away. I'm entitled to having that child all my life. When we had this entitlement mentality with God, and something wrong happens, we question him, like, why? Why did this happen? Maybe you're not the loving God I was told you are. There's a verse of scripture I want us to write down. You can write this down. I'm going to read it to you, Isaiah 49. Some of you have memorized it. It's a great passage of scripture. The whole city of Zion was crying out to God. The Lord has forsaken me, it says. The Lord has forgotten me. And the Lord responds to the city of Zion. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she, may, though she may forget, I, the Lord, will not forget you. I have engraved your, your name on my palms of my hands. I've engraved your name on the palms of my hands. Your walls of your city are ever before me. That's the word of God. We can take that promise because the Bible says it in Hebrews that God will never leave us nor forsake us. Do you believe that? 
You know what? If you don't believe that, then everything that happens in the world is going to shake you up. It's going to go, oh, 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 this is happening. Why is this happening? Does does God know what he's doing? I I mean, I've, I've asked him that sometimes. Do you really know what you're doing, God? Do you know what's happening in the world? Guess what? He is in control. He knows what's happening. And I love the last book I read, and I mentioned it before. In that book, the Bible, the book, the book says, God is not interested in saving America. God's interested in saving Americans. Do you understand that? God's not interested in saving America, this nation. God's interested in saving individual Americans one by one. We need to get that as Christians. We need to get it. We're on a different page than the rest of the world. As I said this before, and I'm going to conclude, I went too long. Be careful what you pray for. Some of the lessons that I learned from this passage is obviously when you pray for patience, expect flat tires, incompetent clerks, slow cars, and plastic bags that break open, which happened to me just this week. Pray that God would change you inside out to give you a different perspective on life. I I pray that now, that I must be willing to set aside my plan. I must be willing to accept direction and his provision. I must trust God for one day at a time. That's all I've got. And I must see a dried brook, not as God's displeasure or punishment, but just something that happens. Because we live in a broken world. I hope. I hope you can do that. I hope you can be like Elijah and live by a brook for a year just because God said to do it. Let's stand as we close in a word of prayer. Father God, we know that you love us no matter how hard we play no matter how hard we work, no matter how hard we do our best, you love us. Father God, I pray that we would learn quietly from you to be sure of your presence and your provision. Father, I know from experience that the battle against evil in this world begins within each one of us. We might think the war is against the government or against the representatives or against this party or that party. We may think that that's where the battle is. But Father God, we need to make sure our heart is right before you. I pray for anyone here, Lord God, that needs to make their heart right with you. That something in the scriptures, something in the story of Elijah has touched their life. That they need to turn and be transformed. Father, in this last song, I pray that if anybody needs to pray, that they would come forward or just pray where they are as we uh, sing this last song. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. All God's people said, amen. Let's sing. Let's sing this last chorus.